Good evening. Praise the Lord. It is Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time, and we greet you this afternoon, or this evening, I should say, from the Huntsville, Alabama area. Uh, this is our midweek Bible study, and we are continuing our ongoing look at uh, a series of study that I have titled simply LGBT Affirming Theology. Very straightforward. Um, we want people to know, uh, LGBT people, we want them to know that we absolutely believe that the Word of God presents a message that is not uh, condemnatory, flat-out condemnatory of LGBT people, but in fact, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is indeed LGBT affirming. We want to go to the Lord in prayer so we can get right into our study tonight. We have a lot of ground to cover. Master, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for, once again, for this opportunity to share the Word of God with our friends, our members, those who are part of our fellowship and part of our ministry by reason of the Internet. We thank you, Lord, for every single one of our extended members. These folks are so important to us. While our ministry in uh, Huntsville is new and we haven't any local Members, as of yet, we have people around the world who count this ministry as their church. And they support us, they love us, they pray for us. And Master, today they count on our being there for them to offer spiritual sustenance, teaching and preaching the Word of God. We ask, Lord, tonight that the anointing and the presence of the Holy Ghost would be upon us. Help us, Lord, to impart that which you would have us to understand and help those that listen to be able to receive. There are so many obstacles that stand in the way and try to hinder us from being able to receive the truth of God. For the Word of God declares, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth liberates. And the enemy wants to keep us bound. He wants us to believe things that are inaccurate and incorrect. And Master, today we want, uh, as the ministry, we want to be a tool to help bring truth and liberation to the listener. Anoint today, O oh God, the teacher, as well as every hearer. Allow our ears, our hearts, our minds to be unstopped, that we might not just hear, but receive with gladness the liberating truth and word of God. For we ask it in none other tonight than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name, Amen. Praise God and amen. Uh, in recent weeks, last week, we did not have our Bible study, and I apologize for that. I almost weren't able to do it today either, but thank God we were able to uh, take care of some things so that that was, um, you know, we were able to do our Bible study this evening. Uh, but in our recent studies, um, I know I've talked about it before, I approach teaching, I approach the Word of God differently than even many LGBT-affirming and progressive Christian ministries approach it. Uh, I've always been, to be honest with you, I've always been a little bit of a maverick. Uh, I'm not interested in following suit. I'm not interested in being like everybody else or trying to sound like everybody else. Folks, I got news for you. For those of you who are new to LGBT affirming churches in general, especially 
churches like ours that are spirit-filled, that believe in um, the gifts of the Spirit, the operation of the Holy Ghost. Um, if you're not familiar with this movement at all, there are churches around the country that believe similarly to us. Uh, there are many churches around the country that are LGBT affirming, but they lean more in a, a Baptist direction or in a Presbyterian direction or, you know, what have you, different traditions. But as far as spirit-filled works, there are some other works out there. I've been doing this now for 30 years, and in the 30 years that I've been ministering within the LGBT community, I have seen ministries come and I have seen ministries go. Um, I've literally watched dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of churches start and close. Um, and yet our ministry, by the help and grace of God, just keeps going. And uh, even when we've been without local members, we've built up enough of a following uh, online so that uh, we feel an obligation to those who watch online. And um, But we have just, you know, been going and going now for 30 solid years and I want to tell you and I don't say this I'm not saying this as if to suggest uh, you know we're better than um, but at the same time I, I do believe <laughs> I do believe that it is an attribute that is certainly better than some there are other churches that believe very much like we do, but I'm going to tell you, they go out of their way to try to sound and look as mainstream uh, apostolic Pentecostal as they possibly can. And uh, they preach messages uh, that are hyper-conservative and ultra-conservative. There are churches in our movement that try to hold all the mainstream party lines that uh, mainstream apostolic Pentecostal churches tote. And that includes uh, their LGBT affirming churches, but they worship the Republican Party. They bow their knee to Donald Trump. Uh, they preach the abortion issue, you know, and, uh, and if you don't believe just the way they do, you're not even welcome in their church. I know this because I have former members of churches that I've pastored who have lived in other parts of the country, and they've attended some of these churches. And they actually told me, they said, you know, this church here and that church there, uh, if you're not Republican, which the people I'm, that I was talking to were not, said if you're not Republican, boy, they just give you all kinds of trouble and, you know. And, and I don't have time for that foolishness, okay? I don't have time. I am not trying... Uh, to please men. I am not trying to please a movement. Uh, I know that the apostolic movement is going to um, have all kinds of trouble with, with us, period, regardless of what position we hold on anything, simply because we are a progressive LGBT affirming ministry. So trying to look like them and sound like them uh, in terms of their politics and their uh, pulling politics into the church and mingling Christianity with Christian nationalism and all that foolishness. I don't have time for any of that. So in our church, you don't run into that. Uh, also, we approach things very differently in our particular ministry. And as we've been studying LGBT affirming theology, one of the things that is uh, unique to us, I guess you might say, is the fact that 
Uh, I do not simply go to all the uh, clobber passages, passages in the Bible that are commonly used to bash and abuse LGBT people. I do not simply go to those passages and try to uh, help us better understand what they may be uh, saying in truth. That's part of LGBT affirming theology. But in this ministry, that is not by any means the whole of LGBT affirming ministry. In a lot of ministries, a lot of churches, that's really kind of their whole stick, you know, is just re explaining and, you know, and breaking these passages down. No, we're this ministry. When the Lord brought me into affirming ministry back in 1993, I didn't know where to start. I literally did not know where to start. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, where do I begin? You know, do I begin? Because he told me I needed to reread many things in the Word of God that I thought were expressly condemnatory of LGBT people. And he told me, you need to reread these things. And, uh, but I, I was, you know, uncertain, where exactly do I begin? And I asked the Lord, you know, where do I begin? Do I begin in Deuteronomy? Do I begin in Romans 1? Do I begin um, in Genesis 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, <laughs> If I were to live to be a thousand, I would never forget this. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me as plainly as, as ever God has spoken to me and said to me, no, you don't need to start with any particular passage. You need to start with a subject matter. There is a subject you need to investigate that you do not understand accurately and you have not been taught accurately and you need to search out and study this subject. And I said, well, what subject is that? And the Spirit of the Lord said, grace. You have to do a study on grace. So I spent months and months researching Every single passage in the Word of God, every one, not most, not many, but all of them, that dealt with grace and had the word grace in it, I looked at every single one of them. As I was doing this, the realities of the doctrine of grace began to flood my spirit and you want to talk about liberating. You want to talk about just breaking you out of a, a terrible prison, you know. Um, I could not believe how badly the church, the modern church, had tormented and tortured and twisted and perverted grace. They talk about grace. They sing amazing grace. They use the word. It is a theological term that is employed, but they have no stinking idea in the universe what grace is or how grace works within the framework of New Testament salvation. They have no concept in the world. Uh, if you come from a Pentecostal tradition, the Pentecostal movement was born out of the Wesleyan Methodist tradition. Wesley, um, it honestly, is one of the first to really kind of contort the concept of grace. He got it in his head that because at his time, uh, in the history of the United States and in the history of the world, there was a lot of decadence going on. There, there was a lot of drunkenness. There was a lot of whoremongering and, you know, messing around. And it, it was very popular at that time. Matter of fact, some of our founding fathers 
were uh, infamous for being engaged in some of these activities. One of the most famous characters was Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was well known to be a womanizer and, you know, a partier, as it were. He enjoyed socializing uh, at very immoral levels, shall we say. And so uh, Wesley came along, and it was, it was all about, you know, we've got to get back to God. We've got to live right. We've got to do right, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that message, like, at its core. The problem is it evolved, and it evolved into a legalism. It, it evolved into, here's a list of rules and regulations that we extrapolate from the scriptures. And uh, if you're going to stand holy before God, you've got to do all these things. And you, you have to wear your hair this way. you got to wear your clothes this way. And all of a sudden, they begin to create all these rules and regulations. You know, thou shalt not drink, thou shalt not smoke. Now, mind you, in the earliest part of the Pentecostal revivals of the, uh, the early 20th century, uh, most of the people who were receiving the Holy Ghost back then and uh, experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and glossalia, speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Um, they were bearded, mustached, uh, pipe-smoking, you know, men. And uh, they drank beer, you know, and not saying they were drunks and all that, but they, you know, they drank, you know. But then all of a sudden with Wesleyanism came, came in this whole new set of laws and wholesome. No, you're not supposed to drink, you know. And then eventually, and it took a while before they really got on the no smoking bone, the no tobacco bandwagon, you know. That actually took a good while to come. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you have all this <sighs> contorting the Word of God to try to make it say something that it simply does not say in simple black and white. And, um, for instance, you know, nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt not smoke tobacco. <clears throat> nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt not drink alcohol. But what happens is there are plenty of passages in the Bible where drunkenness is condemned, okay, and in, in the Old Testament books of wisdom, there are plenty of examples where the writer talks about uh, the dangers and the folly of drunkenness and, you know, and the trouble it leads to, you know. So drunkenness is always spoken of in the Word of God in a very negative context. So what they do is they take that and they twist it and kind of, you know, mold it a little bit. And all of a sudden it becomes, thou shalt not drink. You can't touch alcohol. Okay, it's not what the Bible says. The Bible teaches us not to be drunk, not to allow ourselves to become inebriated. As a child of God, we are always, always, not most of the time, always be in charge of our faculties. And therefore... Um, we don't ever want to give ourselves over to anything that influences us in such a way that we may do or say something that as a child of God we wouldn't have done or said, you know, had we not been impaired. So therefore, uh, do I believe the wisest course of action is to avoid alcohol altogether? I absolutely do. I'll be honest with you. I absolutely do. And that's the way I live my life. And I've lived my life that way, you know, uh, my whole life. I've never had any interest in alcohol. I can have a wonderful time at parties. I can, uh, you know, have a good time with friends. And I can have a wonderful time at um, holiday celebrations. I do not need alcohol, don't want alcohol, have no interest in it, okay? We also, of course, in modern times understand 
that alcohol is addictive, you know, and so therefore uh, we understand there's a certain danger in, in playing with it because if you're not careful, you can wind up becoming dependent. Same thing with illicit drugs and uh, with tobacco. Tobacco, uh, the, the um, logic that eventually came into use to condemn tobacco was, you know, the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and, and tobacco is harmful to your body and therefore you shouldn't smoke tobacco. Well, that's all well and good. Again, the only problem is the scripture does not tell us expressly that we're not to smoke tobacco. The Bible does not say specifically, thou shalt not smoke, you know, or thou shalt not chew or dip or whatever. But this is how, you know, the whole Wesleyan holiness uh, movement started and the holiness movement preceded the Pentecostal outpouring of 1900. Okay, so we wound up with this whole uh, movement toward a legalistic approach to the gospel. All of a sudden it evolved where now faith in the gospel is not sufficient for salvation. No, faith plus this litany of things that you have to do or not do are required in order to be saved. And so that whole theological uh, movement transpired over the course of, you know, a century or better. And it led us to where we are today. And where we are today in the church is we've arrived in a place where grace is a fiction. It is literally a fiction. It does not exist in the modern church at all. We talk about it, we sing about it, but we haven't got a clue what grace really is. Now, in recent weeks, we've been studying a uh, subject matter that I know troubled a lot of people. I was talking about heterosexual abomination, and I was explaining. A lot of people want to believe that, you know, oh, homosexuality is an abomination under God, hallelujah. And they act as though there is absolutely nothing at all in Scripture, nothing in the law uh, that is of a heterosexual sexual nature that falls into the category of abomination. And I showed you where that is not true. The truth of the matter is, uh, adultery is an abomination. And according to the law of Moses, a man or a woman, a man and a woman who are caught in the act of adultery, if they were caught and the conditions met God's requirements, you know, for uh, two witnesses, so on and so forth, uh, both parties were to be stoned. So these fools in Congress who want to talk about how, you know, homosexuality is an abomination to God and it should be outlawed and blah, 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 you know, all this crap. Uh, if they really wanted to be biblical purists, if they really, you know, the, the current Speaker of the House claims that, oh, I believe that Bible. That, you see that Bible there? That's what I believe. He is a liar and he is full of crap. I'm going to say it in plain English. He is full of baloney. He no more believes that Bible than he believes anything. He believes what he wants to believe. He believes what he extracts from the Bible that suits him. Because if he believed the entire word of God, if he were going to apply the same standard uh, to uh, all abomination, quote unquote, listed, and I listed last time we were together, I listed all the abominations in the Bible. And basically by the time you're done, there ain't nothing that's not listed, literally. So literally, it's like over the course of the entire book, 
ultimately, God makes it clear that all sin, whatever sin, lying is an abomination, a false witness is an abomination, adultery is an abomination, you know what I'm saying? So by the time you get done, you find out that uh, all sin falls into the category of abomination. And there's nothing, there is nothing that is defined by the law as sin that ultimately is not also defined as abomination, okay? But a lot of people, as I'm teaching on the issue of, of, of adultery being an abomination, I then talk about the fact that according to the law, Divorce and remarriage was never permitted, ever. Divorce was permitted, but remarriage was not ever permitted until the former spouse was dead. So as long as an individual had a living uh, uh, ex, as it were, they still were bound before God, uh, and they were not free to remarry. And that is the teaching not of the Old Testament alone, but also we saw the same thing being taught by the apostles in the New Testament, and Jesus spoke of these things in the New Testament. And according to the teaching of God's Word, both Old and New Testament, an individual who divorced and remarried was living in adultery. Now, the modern church has tried to explain this away, and they've tried to say, well, bless God, but, uh, you know, once you remarry, you know, then God has sanctified your new marriage. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture do you read that. Nowhere, nowhere is that ideology or that theology represented in the Word of God. Absolutely nowhere. That is garbage, pure and simple. The reality is the divorced person who remarries is living as an adulterer or as an adulteress according to the Word of God. Now, some people, as I'm talking about this and teaching on this, some people begin to feel bad, and they start feeling condemned, which is ridiculous, because once again, you're falling back into that old graceless law mindset, which is why I keep going back and keep going back and keep going back, trying to remind us that the law was given to Moses for the people of Israel. The law was given for a very certain people, for a very certain purpose, for a very certain amount of time. Jesus fulfilled the law. We are not under the law. We are under grace, so on and so forth. But still, as I'm teaching on this, there are some people out there who start feeling bad, and they start feeling like, well, you're just saying that to condemn me. You know, you're saying, no, not in the, not in the least, folks. The reality is this. Listen carefully. When you understand the law the way that God meant for us to understand the law, the law was designed to help us realize our, our absolute need for a Savior. Because the law couldn't do what we needed it to do. In that, according to the Apostle Paul, it was weak through the flesh. We, there's not a one of us that could live up to every mandate of God's law. And according to the law, if you break one point of the law, you've broken them all. All of them. So it is an all or nothing proposition. So it kind of feels really hopeless, you know, it feels really, really dismal, you know. It's like, my God, uh, then we're without hope. Well, that's the whole purpose of the law, is to help you understand that if you were going to try to make heaven on the strength 
of living the life necessary to make heaven, you couldn't do it. You need a Savior. You need God's grace. You need God to be able to look at you and I, imperfect as we are, failing, frail, faulty, sinful as we are, we need some way for him to be able to look at us and see us differently than we are. That's why Jesus came. Our righteousness, according to the New Testament teaching, in the New Testament era, our righteousness is a righteousness by faith. It is not something you possess. It is not something these knuck, knuckleheads running around calling themselves holiness. Who talk, and I know because I used to be one of them, talking about how they're walking in holiness. And they're demonstrating holiness. <sighs> Honey, you, you are so blind and so foolish, it's not even funny. The Word of God makes it abundantly clear. All, 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 all our righteousness is before the Lord as filthy rags. So if you think, lady, having your hair down to your butt somehow or another impresses God, doesn't mean a thing in the universe to him. That that there there you couldn't do enough. You couldn't live enough. You couldn't follow enough rules to impress the Lord with your so-called righteousness or your so-called holiness as it is demonstrated by your behavior and by your actions. Because the truth of the matter is, while you may do many things right, you're simultaneously doing many things wrong. The only problem is, we're willing to see what we do right, we're not willing to see what we're doing wrong. And this is why Jesus told us Concerning, you know, he said, uh, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. He said, but I'm telling you, if a man looks upon a woman to lust after uh, her, he's already committed adultery in his heart. He wasn't making the rules harder. He wasn't making the rules tighter. What he was trying to do was he was trying to demonstrate to the listener, folks, you, even when you think you might be doing everything right, you're still doing stuff wrong. Because you just because you don't go out and commit adultery doesn't mean that where God is looking, man looketh on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. So where God's looking, he's seen you commit adultery. Because you're looking at women, you're looking at someone to lust after them with the intent to lust. You're purposely looking at them with the heartfelt intent to lust after them. Do you follow? So what the Lord was trying to simply do was he was trying to drive home that point that if you think righteousness is achieved by reason of your conduct or your behavior, you're wrong. Because even if you're able to keep all of your external conduct right there's stuff going on internally that isn't right and in the eyes of God that's the same as having committed the act you, do you follow and again people might say wow so once again we're back to that hopeless state no it's not a hopeless state but listen carefully listen carefully it's a humbling state.
It's not about being hopeless. It's about humbling us. You can only look at someone else and judge them. You can only look at someone else and criticize them. You can only look at someone else and condemn them. If you have erroneously convinced yourself that you've got it all right, you're doing it all right, everything, you've got it down perfect, and, and as such, you're in a position to sit in judgment of someone else and to judge someone else. When you understand what I've been teaching about heterosexual abomination, divorce and remarriage, people living as adulterers and adulteresses, is that supposed to make you feel condemned? No supposed to humble you. Because if you understand, hey, if I had to obey the law to make heaven, I'd be as lost as any queer on my street. I'm just as guilty of sexual sin as any gay person in this city. Because according to the law, I would be an adulterer, or I would be an adulteress. I had a family member, a great aunt. She and my great uncle, my grandmother's, uh, on my mom's side, it's my grandmother's sister and, uh, and her husband. My great aunt and uncle came and sang for our church uh, actually, they sang in several churches that I have worked in over the past 30 years. I was in Connecticut for a while, and they came to Connecticut and sang in our church. Over the course of the years we were in Dallas, they came to our church in Dallas and sang for us on several occasions. They're Pentecostal people. They're passed on now, but they were Pentecostal people. And they came, and they sang in our church. And my great aunt told me a couple of things. Number one, she said, ain't nobody going to tell me the Holy Ghost isn't in your church. She said, because I know the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is there. She also told me once, she said, Chuck, I know you, and I know your message. And you're not up there preaching. People can just go out and do anything they want to do and act any way they want to act. She said, I know better than that. You know, and I also know how you live. And I know how, how the, the, the morality and the, the um, decency that you embrace as a Christian and as a human being. She said, I know you. I know your message. She said, I know the Spirit of God is in your church. And then she also said, I also know that I've been twice divorced and three times married. She said, and mind you, she was divorced and remarried. Uh, she was on her, her third husband, my great uncle, uh, before she came to the Lord, before she converted and became a Christian and received the Holy Ghost. And, but my aunt said, and that knowing my background keeps me humble. Who am I to sit in judgment of you or anybody else? Who am I to judge you? You're trying to live for God. You're trying to make heaven just like I am. She said, I've got a past, you know, if, if I were under the law, I'd be an adulteress. She said, so who am I to judge? Do you follow? So that hopelessness that appears to be what I'm peddling is not hopelessness at all. It is in reality what humbles us. If you understand 
that every child of God is a sinner saved by grace. then you should be able to walk in humility. You should be able to accept any believer that walks into your church. I don't care what their life looks like. I don't care what they do or how they do it, whether you agree with it or you disagree with it. You should be able to accept them and love them and support them because... When you understand what I've been talking about, it simply helps to keep you humble. Do you follow? This is where the church today is grossly failing. What was the first sin of Sodom that God spoke through the prophet in the Old Testament? He said, these were the sins of thy sister Sodom. What was the first one? Pride. And pride runs rampant in any legalistic theology. Anytime you try to approach New Testament salvation from the perspective of works being a necessary ingredient and then you convince yourself that boy you're doing a great job because you're doing all the right things and you're doing everything just the way you ought to do it what happens is you are opening yourself up to pride people become proud of themselves and how good they are and how what a great job they do and boy I'm a great Christian I know because when I was in the holiness movement, one of the things about the holiness movement that actually held a certain amount of appeal for me, I didn't realize this then, but I did afterwards, was the fact that, well, there was this litany of rules and regulations, and I could follow all those rules and regulations. And that in turn gave me a sense of pride. It gave me a sense of, boy, I'm proud of myself. You know, I, I do all these things, you know, and, and that makes me holy. And I convinced myself that because I was doing all these things, you know, I was holy before God. And so legalism immediately is going to create the opportunity for pride, okay? Pride and legalism are without fail. Without fail, it is impossible for these things not to then create uh, hypocrisy. It's impossible to embrace salvation from a works perspective and not be a hypocrite at some level. It's impossible. There's going to be something that you talk, but you're not walking. Now, it'll, it may be something different for every one of us. I know one holiness lady that I used to know I'm not going to say who it was or anything. And it's somebody that I'm going to tell you I think the world of. Absolutely thought the world of. And yet, according to people that I know who knew her a lot longer than I knew her, she was an unintentional gossip. She to say it plainly, she didn't know how to keep her mouth shut. And she'd wind up sharing stuff and saying stuff about what was going on with other people and, you know, and and it, it fed the gossip machinery, okay? And this lady was holiness. She was one of the most loving, godly Christian ladies I've ever known in my life. Was she being malicious in her gossip, you know? No, she wasn't being malicious. She just 
didn't know when to, to not say certain things, you know. And so anyway, so uh, the reality is every one of us, the minute you think that salvation is contingent upon your living up to every single rule and regulation, the reality is somewhere along the line there's going to be something you talk that you are not quite able to walk. And you've just put yourself in a position now to be walking in hypocrisy. Now, the hypocrite is going to stand before God one day guilty of three sins as it relates to their hypocrisy, to that one hypocritical transgression. The first thing they're guilty of is the sin that they refused to acknowledge. In other words, the thing they did that they didn't want to acknowledge they did. Secondly, the sin of hypocrisy, which the Word of God states is a stench in the nostrils of God. Thirdly, the judgment by which they judged others, but were not willing to apply to themselves and their own lives and actions. So the heterosexual Christian world must try to make homosexuality some hideous, horrible sin in order to make their heterosexual transgressions appear as a lesser evil. I'll tell you a little secret. I did some research. I used to have an aunt and uncle who did this. They were swingers. You know what swingers are? Heterosexual married couples who engage in wife swapping. I had it in my own family. I had an aunt and uncle who were swingers. They participated in wife swapping. I did some research. I was curious about this quote-unquote lifestyle. It is estimated in America that there are as many as 15 million people who swing. There are clubs and organizations devoted to swinging. They have all kinds of outlets and all kinds of mediums whereby people that swing can be in touch with others who swing, you know, and they can swap partners and do all this mess. And yet, interestingly enough, we don't hear one word from the Republican Party. We don't hear one word in Washington about the evils of wife swapping. We don't hear one word about the immorality of swinging. We hear these brainless twits getting up and trying to suggest that gay people are in the same category as those who practice bestiality, child molestation, all this, you've heard all this foolishness, which is insane. A few weeks ago I made a comment and I knew, I knew when I said it, it was going to set a firestorm. And boy how he did it. Because that one week's Bible study has had 800 and something hits. And I know as sure as I'm alive, I know why it got that many hits. I knew when it happened. I said it's because I made this one statement. I dared to say that homosexual couples in the privacy of their own uh, homes, in private, 
what they do with each other between them, themselves. Uh, is it possible that that conduct can fall within the prime objective of the law, which is to love your neighbor as yourself? Meaning, is it possible for gay couples uh, what they're doing to fall within the parameters of they're not hurting anybody? I dared to say that, and I knew, I, the minute it come off my lips, I knew, I said, you watch, boy, I'm waiting, there's going to be, there's going to be hell to pay for that comment, because all these religious right nuts are going to jump on that like fleas on a dog. <sighs> no, homosexuality is so much worse. Why, we can equate homosexuality with bestiality. Why? How? You're not jumping from one species to another. Got news for you. There are thousands of species of living organisms on this planet, whether they be insects or whether they be animal. Uh, that actually have recorded same-sex sexual uh, activity. Don't tell me it's abnormal. Don't tell me it's not, quote, natural. If it weren't natural, if it were strictly a matter of lust run amok, then why are there all kinds of animal species where you see this behavior modeled. Why are there all kinds of insect species where you see this behavior modeled? If it were against nature, if it were strictly a moral choice, as it were, then the only species you should ever see this in is humanity because we're the only species capable of making a decision based upon moral choosing. But no, there are thousands of animals and bugs and things that engage in same-sex behavior. So if it is modeled throughout the entirety of the natural world to suggest that it is entirely unnatural within humanity is kind of a, a stretch. And I got news for you. When you want to try to put gay, lesbian people in the same category as child molesters and rapists and murderers and uh, all this other crapola, bestiality practitioners, you know. Uh, let me tell you what the Word of God puts in the same category as adultery, incest, rape, child molestation, prostitution, religious ritual sex. Half these twits in Washington who want to run around trying to suggest that homosexuality is unnatural and it's you know, right up here with this terrible thing and that terrible thing. Um, according to the law, honey, if you're guilty of one, you've broken them all. And according to the laws that I read during the course of this Bible study, there were all kinds of prohibitions having sexual contact with your mother's uh, siblings, with your cousins, with your, uh, your, even your stepmother's children was forbidden by the law. So, you know, 
it, it's so easy to just arbitrarily try to pull something out of the hat, you know, and make an argument. The, these people, this is why I preached recently. If you think fundamentalist people give a crap about the Word of God, then, honey, there's something wrong with you. You, you just don't get it. You don't understand. I grew up in that mess, and it took me a long time to realize how far removed from the Word of God they really, 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 really are. The Bible is a weapon to them, okay? It is, it is only there as a tool to accomplish their political ends, to accomplish... Um, them trying to establish themselves with some moral uh, superiority, you know. Uh, they are not by any stretch of the imagination genuinely trying to be saved, number one. And number two, they are not at all trying to genuinely please God with their living. Not even close. There are, I, I was just watching recently a video on YouTube of a man who is real big in the evangelical Christian world, and uh, he was—he actually is the um, editor of Christianity Today, which is a evangelical Christian magazine that's been out since like the 1950s. It's been around a very, very, very long time, and he has said, he said, the evangelical church has lost all its moral high ground. He said, we have lost all our credibility by reason of our support of Donald Trump. He said, we've lost everything. We, we flushed it all down the toilet. But then he began to talk about the fact that uh, because of who he is and the circles that he operates in, this man talks to and deals with some of the highest figures, overseers, superintendents, general superintendents, presidents of various Christian denominations and fundamentalist evangelical organizations. And he said, as I've been talking to some of the top people in these denominations and things, he said, many of them have realized Oh my goodness, we've created a monster, and now this thing is out of control. Frankenstein is out of the, out of the shop, honey. He is out of the um, lab, and he's running loose through town, okay? They've created a monster, and they said, he said that many of the leaders he's spoken to, he said, when they try to talk scripture with people in terms of, but this is what the Bible says how we ought to be conducting ourselves. This is what the Bible says we ought, how we ought to be living and, and how we ought to be doing things. He said that these leaders in evangelical and fundamentalist churches and organizations and denominations are telling him that the followers, the parishioners are looking at them and saying, don't give me that crap. They literally dismiss offhand what the Word of God says. They're not interested. They, they don't even want to hear it. So that is how far removed those people are from any allegiance to the Word of God. And that's why I say, you know, there are a lot of people in Huntsville today who uh, are non-LGBT, and I won't say it plainly, y'all ought to be coming to our church, y'all ought to be part of our church. And the only reason you can't come be part of our church is because that little humbling effect I was talking about earlier, it's lost on you. You've still got it in your head that somehow or another, oh, I'm too good to worship alongside of 
an LGBT person. Oh, I'm I'm too good. No, no, I can't do that. No, that that's far worse than anything I do. Really? Is that so? Once again, you have no concept of what the Word of God teaches. You have no concept of what the Word of God says. You have no concept of grace. And somewhere in you, there is a seed of pride that allows you to think more highly. The Apostle Paul said, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought. And you're thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. Because one thing I love about our church you come to our church, we're not going to stand there and say, oh, the Bible says you're supposed to love your enemies. The Bible said you're supposed to pray for them that spitefully use you. The Word of God said we're supposed to follow peace with all men. The Word of God says that we're supposed to be good citizens. The Word of God says that if we have faith, we ought to have it unto ourselves. Meaning, live your faith. Don't try to force your faith on others. In our church, we don't run from none of that. I teach every one of those things. And on a, on a, every Sunday, you hear those same things being taught over and over and over and over again. So you can go to First Baptist, and you can be taught all this Christian nationalist crap that is completely contradictory to everything the Word of God teaches Oh, but at least there, you know, well, I just don't know if I could go to a church with a gay pastor, honey. The pastor at First Baptist is gay. And if he isn't gay, he's having an affair with a woman. If he isn't having an affair with a woman, he's molesting children. If he isn't molesting children, the re, the re, what I'm getting at is there. Just because you don't know what somebody's issues are doesn't mean they don't have issues. And so you'd be, well, as long as I don't know what their issues are, you know, then, then I can. Well, you know what the difference with me is? I'm straightforward and I'm open and honest. And I say, you know what? I came to recognize many years ago that my orientation is gay. That is my reality. That is what it is. God knows it. I'm not trying to live a lie. I'm not trying to fool anybody. I'm not trying to trick anybody. I'm not living a false life. I'm not pre preaching one thing and then turning around and doing something different. Nope. What you see is what you get. And I am trusting in the promises of God's Word. And I'm convinced that what God has said, he is able to perform. And he said that if I can trust his grace and believe him, that he sees me today as though I were already what I will be after the resurrection. Now, I want to read some scriptures to you. Scriptures that I guarantee you, 90% of, evangelical churches they don't care about these they, they, you can read these to them all day and all night and they're just going to ignore them because they they don't agree with what they want to believe John 8 and 3 and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him no I'm sorry that's about uh, the woman brought to the Lord caught in the very act of adultery in Romans 2 22 Paul writes Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Sure, the same people up there saying, oh, you're not supposed to commit adultery. They're on their second or third wife. According to the law, they are adulterers. But they'll be the very ones that are standing there. What's that called? Hypocrisy. Remember what I said about legalism and how it, it's going to give birth to hypocrisy? Can't help but give birth to hypocrisy. In Romans 13 and 9, For this, Paul writes, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. 
Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I'm sorry, my partner and I, you're not going to tell me that our relationship is just wicked and evil by reason of the fact that it's two males. That's idiotic. That's just stupid. When you've got two people who are trying to treat one another as they would wish to be treated, you know, uh, they're trying to live by that uh, rule, which according to Paul here, as well as Jesus, is the sum of the entirety of the law. He said the whole law is wrapped up. The whole law is tied up with one pretty bow. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And when I dared say that a gay relationship could fall within those parameters, oh boy, our video blew up. Let's see if this week's video doesn't blow up similarly. Because, boy, I mean to tell you, the hypocrites will have a party with that one. That's all right, folks. Come look. I love, I love the numbers. We appreciate your help getting our message out. Galatians 5.19 Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness. You remember I talked Sunday about uncleanness, meaning... Uh, uh, um, reckless living, you know, using your resources carelessly and just partying and, you know, and raucous living. Uh, lasciviousness. James chapter 2, verse 11. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery... Yet, if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So the point being, no, no law within the context of the law of Moses is greater in importance or greater in offense than any other law. So no, if you break any one of them, you've transgressed the law, period. That's how the law works. The hypocrite... No, I'm sorry. Uh, James chapter 2 and verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So see, breaking one point makes you guilty of all. While their own inability, that is of the hypocrite, to live up to the ideal set forth by the Lord ought to cause them to be more understanding and sympathetic to the LGBT community. Instead, they embrace hypocrisy with wild abandon and choose instead to set themselves up higher, at least in their own minds, by putting LGBT people down. Paul clearly taught that the ability to live a life devoid of sexual expression and intimacy was a gift from God and is not something that most people can simply choose to do. In 1 Corinthians 7, 6 through 9, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself. He lived a celibate life. He said, But every man hath his power, uh, his proper gift of God one after this manner, and another after that. 
I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So, an LGBT person, there are people who actually have the gall to say, to say well, there's, you know, you can be gay, you can have a, a homosexual orientation, but you just can't act on it. Well, that, that, that's the stupidest thing in the universe you could ever say. Because it is no less true that the ability to live a celibate life is a gift from God. It is no less true for a heterosexual than it is a homosexual, nor is it any less true for a homosexual than it is for a heterosexual. You, you understand what I'm saying? The bottom line is all human beings, we all feel the need for intimacy. We all feel the need for love. And as I try to explain to people all the time, folks, if you think that being gay is all about sex, if you think... <laughs> Having a life partner is all about picking a, you know, a sex partner for the rest of your life. You have a really dopey idea of, of, of human beings. You, you, you just have a really screwed up notion. But this is how a lot of people on the right, you know, think. They think, Tommy, that you and I are just so full of lust for one another that we just decided, you know, we're, we're just going to live together and party and whoopee all the time. And you know what? There is not a single issue, not a single issue that is experienced in a heterosexual relationship that is not also experienced in a homosexual relationship. You have differences of, um, you have differences in uh, how, how much people like intimacy. You have differences in what type of intimacy they like. You have differences in the frequency of intimacy. Just, and, and when I say intimacy, I'm not even talking about, you know, just sex. Um, Many of us know, you know, sometimes you marry somebody and they're not very expressive. They don't give a lot of kisses. They don't give a lot of hugs, you know. They're, they're not a very expressive, they're not a very physical person. And you may wish they were, but you married them. So what do you do? You're committed to them. You just learn to live with it and, you know, work around it the best you can. And the same exact thing is true for gay couples. There's nothing in the universe, nothing different in an LGBT relationship uh, than you see in straight relationships. The same exact issues. Got news for you, folks. Um, LGBT people have to deal with uh, ED. They have to deal with... Uh, inability or what have you to perform sexually at times, you know. Uh, they have um, issues related to medications they take, issues related to health issues, whatever the case might be. And you know what? The LGBT couples who are committed to one another, love one another, support one another, or are building a life together, they work around those things just like a straight couple does. Absolutely nothing different. If you think those issues do not touch LGBT people, you're out of your mind. I've been doing affirming ministry for 30 years. Do you know how many times I've, I've uh, had to counsel couples and I've had people telling me, you know, well, her ideas of, of uh, uh, you know, she's, the, she's not very affectionate, you know, sir. He's not very affectionate, you know. I can barely ever get him to even hold my hand, or I can barely, you know. And, uh, or, uh, all I want is a kiss before they go to work, and I can't even, you know. I mean, th some of the craziest little things, you know. But those issues are every bit as real for 
any couple, any couple, there, it, it's universal. And the concept of love and commitment in marriage, you know, and devotion to one another, those, those things require the same amount of effort, they require the same amount of energy, they require the same amount of commitment uh, in an LGBT relationship as they do any other relationship, okay? A lot of Christians today read these passages and they they just dismiss it offhand. We've heard these passages God only knows how many times in our lives. Matthew 7, 1 through 5, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, Jesus speaking, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Luke 6.42, Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye, saying, you've got a bigger issue in your life than they've got. But you're more worried about digging at their little issue than you are dealing with your big issue. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. Romans 14 and 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Somebody's trying to serve God. Somebody trying to live for the Lord. Got news for you, baby. God doesn't care what your opinion is as to how good or how poor a job they do. You're not their master. God doesn't give a flying fig what your opinion is on whether or not they're living the Christian life the way you think it ought to be lived, any more than if you came into my house and tried to tell my maid how to clean. Sweetheart, you're going to get dressed down real fast if you come in and you start telling somebody that's in my employ how they're supposed to do their job. It's not, no, you are completely out of place to try to tell another man's servant how to do their job. That's what Paul is saying here, okay? In Romans 2, verses 1 through 3, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. You know, 
It's like I said, you got people out there, they want to condemn the gay person. But they're on their third or fourth marriage. They're literally living as adulterers and adulteresses in the eyes of God. Yet they're more concerned. They're not humbled by this. No, they're proud because they embrace the legalistic view of New Testament salvation. And that pride gives birth to hypocrisy. Because while they're condemning somebody for their so-called sexual impropriety or immorality, they are themselves committing sexual impropriety or immorality as it is defined by the law. Okay? So none of our contemporary hypocrites dare suggest that sex outside of marriage or extramarital sex are on the same level as child molestation or rape or incest or bestiality. Oh, no, no, no. They don't put adultery. They don't put fornication, premarital sex, on the same level as bestiality. Oh, no, no. Oh, we put homosexual against those things. Well, but it's funny because in the law, all those things go together, honey. And to break one point of the law is to have broken them all. So while you're trying to create these divisions and separations and compartments, the law never created such compartments. Okay, yet they happily try to suggest that two consenting homosexuals are no better than the aforementioned. They can't dispute the scriptures that I've cited concerning judgment and what have you. So they resort instead to convoluted logic and extra biblical reasoning which suggests that same-sex sexual encounters are somehow a greater sin than heterosexual sexual sins. Scripture does not support this notion in any way. But since when do they rely upon Scripture? After all, there are more Scripture passages in the New Testament alone. Quoting words which came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ himself that deal directly with divorce and remarriage, then there are passages in the entire Bible that are said to address homosexuality. Guess what subject Jesus never said one word on? Homosexuality. Never said a word about it. Never spoke a single word. As a matter of fact, when he did refer to Sodom and Gomorrah, he said that those cities which refused to believe on him and the people that refused to believe on him, he said they would be harsh, more judgely than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Just more harsh. Huh? Just more harsh. What did I say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm getting tired. Tom Stommy said uh, they're going to be judged more harshly, not harsh more judgely. <laughs> they're going to be judged more harshly than the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because in the end, once we reach the New Testament, once we come into the era of grace, not of law, it is faith that saves and refusing to believe and embrace and obey this gospel is the greatest offense. I tell people all the time, one of my favorite catchphrases these days for the last uh, almost 30 years now, one of my favorite catchphrases has been, God is not offended by your humanity. He is only offended by unbelief. Amen. All right, I hope that now for some of you that were kind of wrestling with some of those 
things I was talking about related to divorce and remarriage. I hope now you have a better understanding of why I even went in that direction and why I was talking about that. In the end, it, it simply is meant to serve as a hum, it's supposed to have a humbling effect on us, okay? When we recognize that if we are to be, um, if we're going to judge by the law, then we're going to be judged by the law. If we're going to hold to others accountable for embracing the law, there's no such thing as embracing a part of law. You can't hold somebody accountable for embracing or failing to embrace one specific law. No, it's not how the law works. The law is an all or nothing proposition. So for those of you folks out there who want to sit in judgment of LGBT people, and yet at the same time, uh, you are breaking in a number of laws prescribed by Moses in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Uh, my friend, when you stand before God in the judgment, the fact that you are the one who tried to impose the law upon others, you're going to, Paul said, you bring that judgment right back on yourself. You're going to wind up standing before God and God's going to say, okay, well, let's see, the law was so important to you that you felt your gay neighbor was supposed to live up to the law. So um, let me go through these 500 or so laws and let's see how many of them you broke. All you have to do is break one, honey. It, it, you, it's not required that you break a dozen or a hundred or 10% of them or 20%. No, no. All you have to do is break one and you're guilty of all. We need grace. We need a Savior. Jesus Christ came so that he could do, according to the Apostle Paul, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh condemns sin in the flesh. What we could not do for ourselves, Jesus did for us. And now he allows us to participate and to share in his victory over hell, death, and the grave through faith in his name and through uh, faith in his gospel. And it is faith that saves. It is faith that allows us to stand righteous before God. All right. We need to go to the Lord in prayer as we close this session. Master, we love you, God, once again. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for this time to talk about the wonders of your word. Lord, as we understand the nature of the law, it humbles us. None of us, regardless of how we live our lives or what we do or what we don't do, none of us is capable of standing before you and claiming to possess any righteousness or any holiness. Lord, today we trust in and we have confidence in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It's the blood that was spilled on Calvary's cross that washes and sanctifies us and justifies us and allows us to stand righteous before you. It's that blood, Lord, that allows our name to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life so that we might be set apart and we might be made ready for that day of redemption when the Lord shall descend in the clouds and call forth His church and those which are dead shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to join you in the air. Master, thank you for this wonderful gospel of grace. Thank you for this wonderful message of faith that you've allowed us today 
to embrace and to hold. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. Because if it was on us, we'd still be lost and we'd be without hope. I pray, God, that I was effective in communicating the things that I was trying to communicate tonight. Lord, I ask you to help every individual to understand uh, those things which have been discussed this evening. And Lord, let those today who may be walking in a spirit of pride, who may be thinking more highly of themselves than they ought, let them be humbled by the law, understanding, Lord, they are not bound by the law. But the law is there as a reminder of our inability to possibly be all that we would have to be if eternity required our living the perfect life. Master, we thank you for this time together. Go with us from this place and bring your people back together at the next appointed time. For we ask it in none other than Jesus wonderful wonderful name i'm not sure how much of this has gone out live we we were having trouble um so it's very probable or possible that you folks hadn't seen none of this i don't know uh, but anyway we will be posting the video however momentarily and uh, that way folks will be able to see it if, if for any reason you weren't able to see it live we are having new internet service put into our house we had a uh, technician out here yesterday and he started to do the work while i had called our other internet people and told them to cancel the other service was very bad we were having a lot of trouble with it so i had told them to cancel yesterday and uh, this new service was supposed to go on yesterday but lo and behold, the fella left the house without having finished. So now we're waiting for uh, a, another guy to come out tomorrow to finish the install. So tonight we had to improvise. And that's why we, we may have had problems um, broadcasting this evening. Because we had to improvise and we were using internet associated with our phones and stuff, okay? But hopefully... Uh, if you haven't seen it live, you will be seeing it shortly uh, in high def video, okay? I hope you'll be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock for a celebration of life in Christ, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. If you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, we need you to come be with us. Check out our website, www.forwardclc, all one word, forward clc.com for location and time uh, I hope you'll come be with us we're trying to do something great in the Huntsville Alabama area and uh, then of course next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time come be with us as we continue our Bible study series on LGBT affirming theology until we see you the next time God bless you in Jesus name is our prayer.